So about a year ago, I made a script, which is over here. It's called uh, Particle to Bubble Pop. And all it does is uh, creates an end cloth object and it makes it look like a bubble and then pops it. And I've had a few questions over the years about, you know, how to set the scene up, how to do stuff like that. Uh, the script I just left online for free because it was part of a project I was about to start and then uh, it sort of fell apart and um, didn't really think anybody was going to pick anything up from it, but um, I did get a few questions over the year and just thought I'd try and go over some of um, part of the setup. So um, kind of a quick final output, I was, we just got Maya uh, 2017 in the office and I thought I'd give it a go now that Arnold's a part of it and this is what I came up with a couple hours of goofing around with the script and then um, the liquid was um, bifrost and I just had some of the bubbles pop within it um, as a like passive collider <clears throat> to give it some um, disturbance and like it was boiling or something. Anyways, um, by the end of this we hopefully we'll be able to reproduce these results again. So, let's stop there. And here you can kind of see just a, a scene. This is kind of up to the point of this is probably going to run pretty slow. I don't think any of these are cached at the moment. The end cloth. Um, so it's driving dynamically. So what I was going to do is um, let is, let's just get rid of all of this stuff and start with a fresh scene. even to the point where let's bring the emitters back enable our nucleus and our particle I think we need that sorry, probably should have done a little bit of house cleaning before this, but anyway um, stuff matters um, within here. I was just didn't get rid of that. We don't need it. So what we have here, and we don't need our bifrost liquid at all. Um, I won't really go over the bifrost part. I'll show you an example of um, how I created it. Uh, but once you have this, you can. It's, it isn't too hard to set up. So what we have here is, and I'm assuming I probably turned off particles. That's fine. Okay. Is particles emitting from that surface with inside the beaker? And to create that, we can just make one off here to the side. Um, this sort of tutorial kind of um, assumes that you know how to do n-particles and um, dynamics already to an extent. So uh, we just go to our n-particles and do omit from object. Uh, we want to change our emitter type, in this case from Omni to Surface, and we don't want 100, we want like, I think I have 1.5 as my default. And in your end particle, you want to change the, I don't know, the... I think you can change it. There it is, yeah. Change it to spheres. All right, reset it. There you go. So beyond that, I went in, added some a vortex field, and some turbulence, and some gravity, uh, and have disabled it within um, within my nucleus. Oh, sorry. I mean within my um, my particle. Uh, my dynamics property is it's gonna yeah it's gonna have ignore solver gravity. So anyways, that's kind of a quick rundown on how to get some bubbles. The reason I chose 
this much separation in mind, um, and there's already a cache on them, is that um, when end cloth, eventually we're going to get down the road where we have end cloth wrapped around it, uh, you're going to want that to be uh, enough room for them to kind of move around uh, without them being on top of each other. Um, that being said, they will be on top of each other, but once they start to move apart, uh, they will enable their collisions again, and um, it can be a little bit problematic. So uh, if you were going to go crazy with this rather than having... I, I would have multiple systems with this kind of a distance. It's, you know, it's... It works for certain things, not everything, though. <laughs> so once you have your particles looking the way you want, uh, I've set this for 350 frames. Um, you know, I've I've gone up to 2,000 to try some stuff, and it gets so heavy on a workstation, on this workstation, that it's uh, almost impossible. So what I've done, uh, like for this example, is I just did five different bubble setups with different um, dynamic settings, different, you know vortex turbulence and gravity fields set into them to kind of give them uh, make them look a little bit different. Uh, I have written a few things within it. Um, the script to accommodate for this problem, those lines exist here. Uh, we can talk about it. Uh, there are um, some problems with it and something that I haven't had the time to look at, but uh, if you wanted the script and play with it, uh, the code is in there for the um, for Python to write expressions, and in doing so, it turns some variables on and off. We'll go over that in a little bit. So, first off, once we have our end particles, um, we are ready to run the script, and the script handles pretty much everything for us. It follows every particle in uh, space in world space. Um, on each frame, it takes its positional value and writes it into a dictionary. That dictionary in the end, so kind of what I'm looking at right here is this bit of information right here. Writes the information into a dictionary and from there um, sorts it all out for us and brings it back in um, so that on frame one, you know, this particle right here, it knows that its world coordinate is whatever coordinate that is. Um, so on and so forth for all of them. It also um, keeps track of the um, birth and death of the particle. Uh, as we move down, I just wanted to go through the script a little bit because I've had a lot of people ask me questions um, on how it works. The beginning part uh, within here, we start doing some cleanup. That's just for organization purposes. It keeps everything in one big folder. Uh, in this little area, we have now take the um, in that section we take the information that we've gotten from our dictionary and we begin to build a motion path based off a curve and that curve is going to follow the existence of where that particle traveled in its lifespan um, and then it's going to take a locator and during each frame of its um, life it's going to have a um, locator at that position of the particle along the curve. And then therefore we can use that locator to move something like a bubble. And that's what happens down here. We create a um, generic piece of geometry. It's a square actually, 8 by 8 by 8. Uh, it just seemed to work well. These are kind of settings. I don't really write a lot of um, UIs. What ends up happening is in production uh, your time is so limited that uh, it's usually just a bit easier to um, sit down with a couple artists and walk through the script just like I am now and get everybody up to speed. If there is use for it, we will, but you know, most of the times it's just you know, you've got a, a few days to whip something together. Um, so with that said, we create a sphere, or sorry, a, a um, cube, and we'll do it off here to the side real quick just so you see what's going on under the hood. move that out. So what we end up with is this, then we need to add a sculpt deformer. 
that's all we're doing in here. Um, it's somewhere in here. Oh, there it is. It's that line. And then we're basically just deleting the history. This just keeps a nice, clean, uniform um, UV set. The uh, If you were to just create a sphere, the UV set wasn't as easy to map to for some of the stuff I was trying, well, the project that we were currently working on. Um, obviously, if this was something you wanted to switch, it's not a problem. But it's I felt it was a little bit cleaner um, as we were working through our project. The next section is... Um, converting the newly created bubble into um, an end cloth object and then it kind of goes into um, whatever the user is more comfortable with in terms of uh, its visual look so you can see collide strength here there's some rigidity uh, input attract mesh is how much the bubble will follow the particle through its life um, and how much it will kind of uh, react to dynamic forces. Uh, these are some individual ones having pressure, um, checking to see if anything is colliding with it at birth, um, resistance to compression, stretch resistance. There uh, is an alteration on some of the point mass so that it's more like a bubble. Uh, one of the things here it says is dynamic and it's, it says zero, it's false. Uh, because this is so heavy uh, as you're building it through, I'm not sure how many particles, but you typically get about 30 to 40, and with this, it just keeps the values at zero as it builds each end cloth bubble. Um, otherwise, it gets a little bit heavy. At the very end down here, you'll see a section where it says is dynamic as one. It runs through another loop and turns them all back on for you. So now that we're going through some of the end cloth settings, um, you can set these afterwards, um, which, um, if you know, if these were all dependent on scene scale. So if you see my scene here, you look at my scene scale, I'm in centimeters. Um, you know, if you build, that's one unit. So that's one centimeter right there, one cubic centimeter. Um, so if you were doing something in meters or if you were doing something in miles or in, you know, in um, something much smaller, you'd have to, uh, adjust the scene scale for that and usually the easiest place to do that is within your at, um, within your nuclear's um, attribute. Um, space scale seems to take care of it pretty well. If you go beyond the meter size, I it tends to want to be scaled back down rather than um, altered. Um, that's me just playing with it for a little bit. You may find other you know other ways to control it. The visibility here is the next set. It controls um, when it says here, you know, it's like at, um, at the frame it's going to die, or birth, it turns on, and when it dies, it turns off. Um, the next part is the expressions. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, I'm going to run the script a couple times first just so you can see what's happening. Uh, this is uh, the popping mechanism. So there was a bubble, bubble to pop, or bubble, particle to bubble first, and then I added this part in later. Um, it just has dynamic constraints uh, to to the object. Um, what it'll also look at is a random set of vertices with on that bubble, and then split those up. So we'll show you that in a minute. Uh, there's a pressure that happens right before it pops, and then what holds all these pieces that have been created together is a glue strength. And then the rest of this is just clean up stuff at the bottom. So hopefully that runs it through, um, runs you through a little bit more of what's going on. Um, up until this point, it's one giant loop, so what that means is that for every particle, it's going to run through this iteratively, and like I said, it's like 35, 40 bubbles that usually get created within that. You, you could go crazy and add more, but um, that's about how many times it runs through. And then, yeah, like I said before, this just turns everything back on and sets the value to one um, to reset our dynamic, um, reset all of our dynamics. So 
Um, everything else down here we'll go over in a little bit. It's all commented out, so you normally just grab everything. Uh, you need to grab the particle that you want to use and hit go. So you see that it went through up there. Um, it gives you a little bit of feedback as it's going through, but not a whole lot. Um, but you can now see that these curves have been built. Um, it tells you where that particular um, curve line is going to die, which I thought was a little bit useful with the um, animation curves. It kind of gives you a heads up. So you see one's going to start at 81, one's going to start at 21, 241, 121. So and in all of their deaths up here. So if we hit play at this point, it usually takes a 30, 40 frames for the one to show up. And what may happen the first couple times is that you just have to hit rewind a few times. Um, sometimes weird stuff can start occurring. And I don't know if that's just because it, the end cloth engine needs to be reset or not. But. Right, it's getting some strange stuff out of that bubble. Huh, it looks like it's colliding with the bubble. Uh, you know what might be going on? I don't think there's a collision layer on this. I think I deleted it. Um, anyways, here's the groups that it creates. We'll go back over that in a second. Let's just come in here. It looked like it was because those um, particles were cached. Um, so with that selected, let's go into end cloth, create passive collider. And then let's just make sure our passive collider is set. So sometimes it won't show up. You'll have created it there. You'll just need to go back um, to the beginning again for the collision thickness to show up. I just put 0 0.01, and then like it didn't even update there, so I had to reset it again. Um, usually works pretty good. Maybe 0 0.005, how's that? So it's a little bit closer to the glass. We also don't want any friction because it's a glass and bubbles, so. Um, with that being said, let's grab the particles again and run the script. also take the end particles and disable them. We do not need them at this point anymore. Um, in case they were actually pushing on the bubbles, I didn't didn't look into that, but it could have been what was causing some of the problems. Okay, so you can see that everything seems to be working. Everything's colliding with the container now. Um, the bubbles will collide with each other as well. Uh, if you do run into issues ever, one of the kind of easy things is to just increase the size of the beaker a little bit. Um, if you have things that get burst right up against the edge, uh, that's also one of the reasons why this disc inside isn't that big. 
in case they birthed out here around the rim of that disc. So, once we're at this point, we can go ahead and... Let's look inside here real quick. Um, I've got this one selected. So the way the hierarchy is working is there is just a cleanup um, for each group, so not the best naming, um, who's was writing this on the fly. But um, within that group of things, there is a locator, and then parented underneath it is our bubble. Uh, you'll notice on the locator that there is a... Um, it's receiving its transformation coordinates from the motion path, and then there's a keyframe that has been set from the script on the locator. Uh, that visibility also drives its child, which is the bubble. Uh, the bubble receives a scale factor, a random scale factor, so that our individual bubbles, you know, have a slightly different um, look on each one of them. That is about it. Um, there's your curve that you can see uh, that we created from our motion path. These are our um, end cloth attributes, so as you can see the little red dashes along the way down. They have different keyframes set. Um, we can come into our dynamic properties. You can see something like input mesh track. So for this one example, um, it probably starts off at 101 for this particular bubble. And it says it's ending around 178, 188. So if we zoomed in, we would see 178, so 10 frames later. Um, it's putting total, or it's putting, so it's putting 70% of the control back. And so what you're seeing here is at birth, um, the input attract mesh is what, how much attraction to this particle this bubble has. And at birth, it's 70%, and 30% of it is left to dynamic um, end cloth to deal with its dynamics. But 10 frames later, you'll notice that it has been reduced down to 30%. So 30% is, um, being driven by this particle um, in space, and 70% is left up to dynamics. And with the dynamics that I've given it for the scene scale, it is, you know, similar to a bubble, um, but we, this could be easily be changed um, for any of these very easily, uh, which is setting a few new keyframes. And then our dynamic constraint, they're all off. But you can see those are the verts that the script has picked. Um, you can even see ones that haven't even been birthed, or, you know, these ones haven't been birthed. Uh, these ones have died. But you can see which ones will explode. So if we kept playing forward... That's kind of what you get right there. So all all that. So if one of the things I wanted to do was make it a bit more random and have it, you know, run down a line and then every, you know, I don't know, fifth edge or something, take a left turn or something and just kind of see what interesting um, effects you could get with it splitting through the middle or something like that. Uh, for now, it was just this, but, um, you know, with a little bit of clever code, I'm sure you could come up with something far more interesting. So... At this point, it's probably a good idea to uh, start caching out our um, bubbles. And the reason, so you could at this point theoretically just texture this and um, you'd be good. Um, what I would probably do is cache out the bubbles. Um, if you notice through all these, they're all called n clock bubble 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So, uh, for that, if we just went in, cloth, bub, and then through a wildcard edit, we would be able to select all of our end cloth in one, one go. Um, it's just to cache this out real quick and turn off Nucleus after that. So if we came up here, oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong menu system. End cache, <clears throat> create new cache, object. Uh, I've been using one file for frame. Uh, you could probably pick whatever you wanted. Um, we'll just call this N cloth tests. 
And so one every frame. Yep, everything looks good. Hit go. And I'll be back in a second when this is all finished. So that all finished. Um, let's see all of our bubbles now. And I might just turn a few of these back off again. Oh, uh, where are the locators are there? All right. So. Now that we have bubbles popping, you could also render this at this point if you wanted to. Um, the problem with that is that if you look in your outliner over here, you have a ton of stuff going on, and it's all collapsed and kind of makes it clean. Um, but there's a lot of other stuff just going on anyways. Um, one of the things we can turn off now is um, the nucleus. Uh, it's just running in the background, doesn't need to be there anymore. Um, but it's always better when you're handing stuff off just to have something that's uh, much cleaner. And so there's kind of two things you can do here. Um, if you wanted to do uh, the liquid simulation, you could just export these bubbles out as they are right here as a GPU cache. Now, the reason I say you can do that for simulation is because uh, when you do it with, through a GPU cache, they don't come with UVs. This can cause problems with rendering. So, uh, I tried it with mental ray, and it actually, um, without UVs, just to test if I could put a 3D projection of um, like an oily substance on it, I, it actually crashed quite a few times. Even Arnold had a few few dislikes with um, how it was handling it. And I'm assuming that's something to do with the export settings. Um, just kind of freak out about it. So um, I did it for the simulation. Um, this was kind of how I created the. Well, this is how I created the the bubbles. I emitted bubbles, but rather than having them emit at different heights, I um, set all their heights to the particles to die at a certain height with a um, expression. And that allowed me to um, pop them all at the same level and then you can turn these kind of into a passive collider as well with um, and then have them react with the um, bifrost material or the bifrost particles and get some interesting splashes. Uh, they were slowed down in that particular video uh, just because the um, the actual speed of them was a little violent and it was bubbling straight out of the beaker uh, at that point. But same same idea. I just rather than having different heights, just set them to the same height. So or all to die at the same height. So how do we keep the UVs then? Uh, well, you, you, can, you can use a limbic, um, and a limbic does have um, the ability to write um, UVs, as you see down here. Uh, but unfortunately, with the way this is set up, this setup will not work, uh, because you would need to grab the locator and the bubble, and I'm, I haven't looked into the reason yet for exporting, um, but what ends up happening is that you export uh, just like, if, let's say you wanted to grab the locator because you know you needed the um, visibility and you needed the um, height transformation. There's a link still between the that information and the locator and that curve, um, and it comes up with an error and it doesn't work. So the only solution I found at this point, ah, that's one of the issues. The other issue is you can't even do it with um, <laughs> n-cloth. Um, sort of jumped ahead of myself. 
The other thing, if you notice here, is that um, we need to find a way to get our vert count to be uh, the same. So look at it here. It's on this particular one. It's 542. Um, if we start stepping back through frames, it's 390, 386, 36, 36. Okay. And then 542, 555, and zero. That's not really going to export. So we have to come up with a solution that keeps them all the same amount of verbs. So we know that uh, on the output mesh, which is our in cloth, there's also um, what's sitting underneath it. It's called our, um, sorry, <laughs> I reversed that. Our end cloth is our current mesh, and our what's underneath um, that shape is called our input mesh. And that's the original um, bubble that we created in the beginning, and then within the script we put end cloth on top of it. So it duplicates it. Uh, you don't see it here in the outliner, but it is there. Um, so if we actually if we were to show that right now, we would say display input mesh, and that is our, our actual transform of that bubble. And then on this shape layer, it applies all the end cloth dynamics. So, what we can do down here is a little, um, a, a little piece of Python that um, takes all of the cache that sits on our end cloth and applies it to our input mesh. And we need that because, you'll, as you'll see in a second, our input mesh is what. Um, then we're going to take the cache and apply it, and, and that'll hold all the um, vertices at the same time. I think I'm actually kind of <laughs> confusing myself here. So you can see these couple lines right here. It's going to go through and select everything by bubbles. Now, I realize this is commented out, and I'm selecting pieces of the code, um, which is not a really good way to do things. Sorry, just bring it into here. Um, what I've done is selected a little bit of um, the code here um, that is commented out, and this is what is not a good thing. Um, I have to remember that I'm screen grabbing from, or screen recording from one window here. And keep in mind that if this is how you ran it, that you couldn't have anything else called bubble really in the scene. Um, it would select that as well, but as you can see over here, my outliner, that is fine. So with that selected, what we're going to do is then um, select those and create a set, and you'll see that down here, and it'll put that set of bubbles in there. We're going to use that for our export, and then run this. Now, I've run this in sections. You could just grab all this right here and run it at once. It would run just fine. I'm just trying to walk you through it. Um, and then this for loop is going to do what you said, move all the um, cache from the end cloth to the input mesh. And we're done. So, how do we tell that there's something different here going on? Um, let's just turn off our end partners. We can see now that if we turned on our um, display border edge, we can see where all the cuts have already been made. So that one's about to explode. And you can see exactly where all those. So those thick edges are obviously where the, um, it, it's a border edge. And you can see it there. So anywhere there's a big thick green line, that's a border edge. So this is good. We now have um, all of our cache moved to our input ca um, input mesh, and we now have yeah. And the key to all that was um, to get the vert count to be the same. And you'll now see that it, it always lives on 562. That's what we want until it dies. And then it's gone anyway, so we don't have to worry about it. 
So the reason we created this is because we're going to export this out as an FBX. And FBX, um, when it comes to um, caches, you have to have each individual object within a set. So what that means is in order to do this, we have to do a little bit of um, selecting on this. And we need the locators because we need two different things. We need the transform and the visibility, uh, which is what lives on our locator. And then all of the cache information lives on our bubbles. So let's just go up here real quick and do the name of all of our locators. Our locator name and then wildcard again. That'll select all of our locators in the scene. And we're going to go up to export selection. Oh, so it's already set to, mine's already set to FBX. Um, you can see I've run this a few times. So for mine, I'm going to call it 11, just so it ends up at the end there, but I'll just call it uh, tutorial. The settings that we need are, so I leave bake animation on, that's just because I know that my next scene is going to be 350 frames. Um, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure if that's if it's necessary. Um, I feel like it's not. But the, the big thing here to get is that the geometry cache file is bubbles to export. So our selection is going to grab our locators, our cache is going to grab our bubbles, and that's about it. I'm using the current one 2016-2017 version. Uh, when I wrote the script, I was on 2013, so I know 2013 through 2017 all work fine um, without any changes. Everything else, you don't need lights or cameras or anything like that, so um, all that can be nicked. So we'll hit export selection. It's going to run through a couple times, and then... Um, save everything out and we'll pop over to a new scene. Perfect. Complex animation baked. Great. So let's open up a clean scene. Or just got another instance of Maya open. And let's go ahead and import this in Clearly, I've done too many of these. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Hopefully, your scene's not as chaotic. Um, so they're all going to end up in the middle. This is going to be wrong, um, but that's fine. It just move your timeline back and what we should be able to see is that all of our bubbles are bouncing off our beaker and emitting into the scene oh, and we only have 500 frames so or 200 frames sorry and so the rest of it's there perfect well, this is better. Um, you could import these, but what about just having an Alembic? Um, the file sizes are very manageable, um, and they thread very well across all the machines. So that was sort of the um, end of my last video was getting them all over to Alembic, um, because what you can do with a cache anyways is offset and change a little bit of timings on that so that you can get a little bit different um, feeling for the bubbles. So in order to do that you can just grab the main group up top and go to export selection to Olympic. Uh, so if you wanted a lot of motion blur and stuff like that you would need to, I think I originally had it set down to point 0.1 um, for this example. We're not going to render anything so I'm just going to leave it at 1. Uh, so 
if you're doing 350 frames and you have this at 0 0.1, it's going to do 10 iterations per frame. So 10 times 350 is 3,500. So you're going to be here for a little bit longer. Um, you obviously want UVs because the, the, the catch with this is that you still have clean, um, easy to use UVs. And then um, these can all be turned off. They were set for another project, but uh, feel free to add anything else that you want. It, it doesn't really add any any size. So we'll go ahead and export our selection. And I've conveniently made something called Bubbles Tutorial, so we'll just call this um, Bubbles Tutorial 3. Not 34. And all of our settings are over here again. I'll hit go to run through. I've only got one selected. Let's try that again. Yes. We called it three. Let's try that again. You can see it was a little small. It was 8.5 8 megs as opposed to the one I just tried before, which is 100 megs. All right. So let's just do a new scene again. These FBX ones are just temporary, uh, but it's nice to have little iterations of kind of in-between steps. So if we come back to cache, Olympic cache, import Olympic, and we'll go to one, two, three, import, and move our timeline to 350. You can see our cache is there. So, and the nice thing here is we can offset, so we can offset that by 50, um, rather than, you know, hold, we can have it loop, so now let's go 700, and it'll start again, which is kind of nice. Um, for, you know, if you had a, a long sequence that you needed to do, like I said before, the 2000, um, became a little bit difficult. You can also change the speed in half. Uh, it, it starts to get, it starts to do stepping. Um, if you go the other way, oh, sorry, that's 10 times faster if you want. Um, so just keep in mind, it starts to look a little bit funny, but um, it works quite well. So. It's kind of a lightweight way of um, getting all your particles out. Uh, but with this, if you wanted to introduce it into, you know, um, you, you, you could set these and then bring it into um, a Bifrost animation and then just add these as um, colliders within um, Bifrost and uh, get kind of a popping action. It wouldn't be quite as realistic, but um, as doing something with like real flow or uh, within Houdini, but um, for a cheap effect within Maya, um, it, it, it'll work. So um, I hope that helps. The only thing I was kind of looking at to go back over um, was just some extra stuff that was in here. I can delete this real quick. Um, and that was... this one little piece in here, if for some other reason you wanted to go, let's say, to 2,000 frames, um, and you wanted to figure out how to do that within here, uh, what ends up happening is there's so much calculation after about, so I think that one had 11 bubbles. Um, I've gotten it up to about 30, and that was about the limit of my machine, um, even with 128 gigs of memory in it. Uh, it started to get a little bit, and even 12-core uh, processor, or 6-core, six 6-logical, six 12-core, um, but it's it starts to really take a toll very quickly on the machine. Uh, so I added this one extra piece in, and um, honestly, if, if, if you've gotten everything that you wanted, you can, you can probably stop listening now, but this was just one extra little thing. Um, and it is not even working. 
but I thought it was sort of an interesting little technique. Um, so we've got that. Let's just turn the particles back on. So what this will do is write an expression, and that expression is going to sit within each particle and say, uh, and look at the um, end cloth. So let's run this real quick. It'll be a little bit easier to see. And if we play forward now, everything seems to be going well except that our end particles are causing issues again. All right. Things move really fast, and that was sort of the point, was I wanted to create this a bit more efficiently. And interestingly enough as well, the first bubble works fine. Um, it's colliding with the surface. And what we can see is that if we come down here to our animation expression editor, editor expressions, now, I'm not sure which expression is living on this one, but um, you can see if the frame is greater than or equal to 117 and the frame is less than or equal to 218, um, then please turn the uh, dynamics on. So that's living um, over here on the end cloth. This isn't a keyable um, attribute. So this expression gets run every single frame, and it looks at whether or not... Um, it's on these frames and then turns that value on or off. That being said, it seems like it's working fine. And then wait for the second bubble, just went through, third bubbles going through, all of them go through after the first one. So I'm not entirely sure, um, it's something I want to go back and take a look at, but it speeds up the um, process of this um, exponentially. Uh, you could run thousands of thousands of them because the only thing it'll be processing is the active um, um, bubbles at that time and it knows it's birth and death time so that was very easy to give that, that information. So um, with that in mind if, if you feel like you're interested in um, solving that problem please let me know. It would be great. Um, but I may look into this in the future. It was sort of the next thing in my to-do list of things at home uh, for fun. So, um, yeah, if, if, if you come across that would be great, but if not, it's just one of those. Um, I might get to it one of these days. Otherwise, just kind of use the technique I was using before where you just uh, build off a limbic and then turn it into a cycle. Uh, and I got about 150 different beakers in, and it worked. It was a little bit slow on render. Uh, but it did work fine, and you could scrub it in real time. You, know, you could even play back in real time. The downside was the render times went through the roof. So um, Arnold was a very good and handy way to just do some um, the, the kind of a... It's an instancer. They, they call it something different in um, Arnold, but uh, that works very well, too. Same with Mental Ray. So I uh, hope this was helpful. Um, if you have any questions, just let me know. Um, all my details are... Um, either on Vimeo or um, YouTube. So thanks a lot.